Good to have you with us this evening. This is the evening that we begin our Members' Choice Sermon Series. If you'll remember, closer to the first of the year, I asked the congregation to make submissions about topics, texts that you would like uh, preached upon. I said that we would take those and uh, devise lessons uh, concerning those issues or topics. And uh, yeah, I said we wouldn't preach on all of them, but we would select some of them to preach on during the uh, fall quarter. And that's what we're going to do from now to the end of the year. Um, let me say this. There are some, some guidelines in doing sermons like these. As I told you before, when I, I first presented this idea, I did this in Missouri when I was preaching there, and, and you got uh, some very different um, suggestions and things of that nature. Not all of them were worthy to be preached upon or, or really credible to be preached upon. There are things that you know, maybe we need to sit down and talk about one-on-one -on -one and things of that nature, but I did pick out the ones that I think that uh, are worthy of being preached upon that need to be preached upon. Those submissions were anonymous, so I don't know who submitted them. Some people signed their name, but most did not. Now, I want you to understand this as well. In preaching these different things, I've noticed that sometimes people make submissions with an agenda in mind. Understand, I'm not going to preach your agenda. I'm going to preach the truth and in a very balanced, logical way. For instance, one of the submissions, and again, it was anonymous, one of the submi uh, submissions was on dancing, should a Christian dance. If you want me to outlaw all dancing, I'm not going to do that because the Bible doesn't do that. But I could see how that could be a topic that could very easily be a, an agenda item. So just understand that we're going to take these topics from a balanced, logical approach, preaching the truth of God's Word. And that's what we're doing tonight with the submission. I do know who submitted this one because he told me, Mike Thornton, and this is yours tonight, Mike, and this is on the subject of lying. And we're going to talk about the truth about lying. To say that lying is a problem in our world today would be a vast understatement, right? And because it's so prevalent, it often gets treated as kind of a Class C misdemeanor sin. We try to justify it, and we create categories for lying, don't we? Little white lies are the, the ones that aren't that important, really, and they're okay. Uh, you can get by with those. Then the big black lies are things that you want to avoid at all costs, unless, of course, you have to lie. Then, you know, <laughs> then you got to, right? And we see politicians using lying to, to get out of trouble or to get elected. We see, you know, attorneys sometimes lie for their client to get them off. Of course, the attorneys that go to church here don't do that, but we do see some. Used car salesmen may, may use lying as a tactic to, to sell a vehicle or to get one moved off the lot. Some of you guys lied through your teeth in order to get the wife that you had. You had to have, right? Because no other way she would have gone out with you. We see lying employed in many different ways and under many different circumstances so that people can gain for themselves. And that's really what lying is. It's deception for selfish gain. There is distinctions to be made with lying, and we're going to talk about those here in a few moments. Again, we want to be balanced in our approach. We want to understand what the Bible has to say about lying. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments because we see an example in the Bible of Rahab who lied and seemed to be praised for that. So how do we deal with that issue? We're going to look at that tonight. Lying denotes deception. More specifically, as we said, deception for one's own advantage. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, we see that there are some things that God hates. Six things that he hates, seven that are an abomination to him. And among those is a lying tongue. Now, the Hebrew literally le uh, reads a tongue of deception. In the Septuagint, it's the Greek word atikos, and it's used to mean unjust, vicious, unrighteous, iniquitous, deceitful, or fallacious. All words that are very egregious in nature, right? Inherent within this word is the concept of one who desires through vicious fallaciousness to do personal injury to another. So not only is the telling of lies to cover one's iniquity, it is also to cause personal harm or injury to someone else. The person who lies or has a lying tongue is the person who doesn't care about the truth, is not interested in the truth. Not only do they tell lies, but they, they do so to gain something from them and to hurt another. Lying's a big deal. We need to understand that. Because it's a big deal to God, it should be a big deal to us as well. In Genesis chapter 12, we see Abram lies about his wife Sarai. First of all, we notice 
from Genesis chapter 12, and you can follow along as we go through this. We're not going to read verses 10 through 20, but we see that, that lying is for the cowardly, and Abram teaches us this. Abram was in Palestine. A famine came upon the land, if you'll remember, and so he decided to go to Egypt. Egypt was a land of abundance. Uh, it had a lot of grain. However, Abram feared for his life because his wife was, was a pretty lady, and he feared that the Egyptians would kill uh, him and take his wife. And so he lies and he tells Sarai, his wife, to say that she was actually his sister. That was in order to avoid the threat to his life. There are many times that we lie because we're too cowardly to tell the truth. We see, though, that in the account of Abram and Sarai that God is still against it for whatever the reason is. Abram, we know, is most noted for his faith, but here it takes a back seat. His faith should have won out and caused him to step out regardless of the circumstances and tell the truth, but alas, that's not what happens. We all need to be brave enough to stand up for the truth. You know, a few years back, professional call, uh, golfer Brian Davis was in a, a playoff with one of my favorite golfers, Jim Furyk, and this was his first tournament as a pro that he had a chance to win. And Brian Davis chipped onto the green, but as he did, his club touched a twig in its backswing, and therefore that would cost him a penalty, two strokes. Now, nobody saw it. Nobody ever recognized it. And here's Brian Davis locked in a playoff with Jim Furyk, one of the greatest golfers in the game, Here's his chance to beat Jim Furyk and to win that trophy in his first tournament as a professional, but he calls the penalty on himself. Even though no one else saw it, he calls it on himself, cost himself the match and $400,000 in the process. He doesn't win the big tournament. In fact, finishes second. But because of his integrity, because... He was an individual that believed in the integrity of the game and believed in telling the truth. He did so. We also see from Abram's example that lying can make you popular. Abram went to Egypt, and the Egyptians did notice the ravishing beauty of his wife. They took her to Pharaoh's house to be his mistress, and they blessed Abram with abundance. His lie brought him great blessing, but because it was gained through deceptive means, it would cost him in the end. It was hollow. Another famous golfer by the name of Bobby Jones took a two-stroke penalty himself in the 1925 U.S. Open. His ball moved after addressing it, and again, nobody saw it, and yet he saw it, and because of his honesty, he ended up losing that event by one stroke. Later, he was praised for his integrity and treated like a hero, in which he replied, you may as well praise a man for not robbing a bank. The world saw Bobby Jones' actions as heroic and they put him on a pedestal. But that's because they don't see that kind of thing very often. They don't see it among their own. Jones wasn't concerned, though, about his popularity or about being a, a hero. He was concerned about being right. And I think that should be our primary concern as well, of being honest and pure. And finally, Abram teaches us that, that lying will always catch up with you, and there is always a cost to lying. God sends plagues upon Pharaoh's house because Sarai was there and Pharaoh knew he had wronged God and he calls in Abram. Pharaoh wanted to know why Abram had done such a thing and Abram never answers Pharaoh. He knew that his lie had caught up to him and had wreaked havoc for those involved. Abram was sent away in shame with the wife that he had given to Pharaoh because of his cowardice. Lying is damaging to the character and reputation of an individual. It brings shame, and it often brings collateral damage. The shame and reproach is not always thought of in the beginning. If it were, then we'd probably avoid it. But a lie has no legs. And so it takes other lies in order to support it. Lies get stacked on top of one another until at some point it all comes tumbling down. And with it, our integrity and our reputation, this is damaging to all individuals, but especially Christians. Christians cannot afford to use their tongue for deception because of the collateral damage that's involved. When a Christian speaks with a deceptive or lying tongue, it, only, it not only affects their livelihood, but their influence on others. People see us as hypocritical, damages our reputation, 
It can destroy our influence. Few are going to be drawn to Christ or Christianity when they witness a Christian with a lying tongue. As I've said before, Christians are the best argument for Christianity, but they can also be the best argument against Christianity. And certainly that's the case when we have a lying tongue. We've got to show the world how to act. We've got to be different and set apart, separated from the world around us. And one of the ways that we can do that is by speaking from a pure heart and speaking pure words and not being deceptive for selfish gain. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Our tongues should be used to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. A tongue that speaks lies negates the truth that we should be about, not to mention that the Bible is clear that such is sin. Both the Old and New Testaments paint a very vivid picture of the disdain that God has for lying. Leviticus 19 and 11 states, You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. That's pretty clear. Proverbs 19.5 reads, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who tells lies will not escape. In Ephesians 4 and 25, Paul writes, Therefore, laying aside all falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are all members of one another. And in Revelation 21 and verse 8, it reads, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Understand that a a lying tongue is contrary to the character of God because God cannot lie. That's Titus 1 and 2. God desires truth in our lives. Psalm 51 and 6, David writes, Behold, You desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. God is a God of truth. Again, it was David who stated, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Jesus identified himself as the truth. In John 8, 31 and following, he states, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of nine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 17 and 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then, of course, John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus identified God's truth as the truth and himself as the personification of truth. John 1 and 1 reads, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, it only makes sense that if God cannot lie and Jesus is truth, then as his disciples, we must be about truth. Peter lied about knowing Christ. Cain lied about the murder of his brother. Jacob and Rebekah lied to Isaac. The first case of church discipline that we read about in the New Testament involved Ananias and Sapphira, people who were struck dead for lying. Lying is an abomination to God. It is an unjustifiable sin, but that doesn't stop many from participating in it. A man by the name of Alexander Haig once said, that's not a lie, it's a terminological inexactitude. Robert Feldman said, we found that lying is actually associated with good social skills. It takes social skills to be able to control your words as well as what you say non-verbally. National survey by Rutgers Management Education Center of 4,500 high school students found that 75% of them engage in serious cheating. More than half have plagiarized work they found on the internet, but perhaps the most disturbing thing about this study was that they don't see anything wrong with it. They don't see anything wrong with cheating. Some 50% of those responding to the survey said they don't think copying questions and answers from a test is even cheating. One student stated this, said, I believe cheating is not wrong. People expect us to attend seven classes a day, keep a 4.0 GPA, not go crazy, and turn in all of our work the next day. What are we supposed to do, fail? I don't know about you, but I hope that person is not standing over me someday with a scalpel fixing to do surgery. Again, We have too many Christians that are unrecognizable, indistinguishable from the world around us because they are engaging in things that are worldly and even excusing them or justifying them. Like chameleons, they're just blending in. They're camouflaging their Christianity. They're they're putting their light under a bushel basket. Remember the words of Paul, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. To live as a new creature in Christ, to be consecrated, holy as he is holy, means that we've got to act counterculturally. 
We've got to be different than the world around us, and certainly that includes how we engage others in the way that we speak, in the way that we seek to be pure and truthful in all our actions and interactions with others. We need to be a people who are about a lot of things, and certainly we need to be about truth. Lying identifies one with the father of lies. John 8 and 44, Jesus states, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. For better or for worse, we're going to be identified with a father, either the father of lies or the heavenly father. I think all of us here want to be identified with the Heavenly Father. We want our character to reflect that of our Lord. We want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, not be associated with the father of lies, the devil. I think it is important, as I said a moment ago, to make some distinctions when talking about lying or deception. Understand, lying is as much a motivational thing as it is a factual thing. Lying is based on motive and intent. Rahab lied when she hid the spies, and yet we find her name among all of those in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. James writes, in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? So how does this add up with what we're talking about? Well, first of all, if you want to get technical, we never see Rahab and her lying condoned. We never see God directly praising her for her lying. The case of Rahab is an example of God honoring a person due to their obedient faith in spite of a personal character flaw. And in spite of her sordid background, Rahab had generated a, a growing faith in her heart for God. This woman had come to believe in the one true God and his power to deliver. Admittedly, she did lie in the process of hiding those spies, but her faith and obedience allowed her to obtain pardon from her life of harlotry. Rahab was commended for her faith, but we don't really see her commended for her lying. She is honored for her courage and for her acknowledgement of the workings of the true God, not in the manner in which she pursued the protection of the Hebrew spies. But it could be argued, based on what we talked about a moment ago, was Rahab's lying for selfish gain? Was it deception for selfish gain? Rahab's motivation and intent were not for her own glory or to injure another. It was for the purpose of helping the spies. You understand this is not a case of, of situation ethics. That's not what I'm trying to promote. We find no evidence of God condoning Rahab's lying, as I said, but it should be pointed out that Rahab's lying tongue does not fit the description of lying in, in Proverbs chapter 6 that we read from a moment ago. You know, there are some distinctions to be made without letting the cat out of the bag. Parents, you talk about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy, and you know what I'm getting at. It should be noted that concealment is not necessarily lying either. You've heard all your life that honesty is the best policy. Well, yes, to a degree, right? I mean, there are times when it's best not to say something, there are times when it's best to keep our tongue in a cage. You know, it's like that Geico commercial where you have Honest Abe sitting there and his wife asks him if that dress made her look fat. Guys, we know that's a must-lie situation, don't we? You know, you don't always tell the truth in that situation. Maybe it's best just to not say anything. And you know, remember Honest Abe, unable to, to tell a lie, just says, yeah, maybe a little bit, and she stomps out of the room. You know, sometimes we don't have to say anything. There's some people, like I've said before, who, who think that, you know, honesty is uh, the best policy, and so they use that as a license to say anything and everything, and they're very offensive. You know, sometimes you're not being honest, you're just being rude and insensitive. There's no question that withholding information in certain situations is deceptive and sinful. However, there are instances when some things are better left unspoken because of the hurt feelings that can occur. I've seen this in, in, in church work, I know the elders have dealt with this. I have dealt with this where we have a situation that is a very dicey situation within the congregation uh, concerning a certain member. And people want to come up and say, hey, what's the deal with so-and-so? Well, I, I know what the deal is, but I can't tell them that. It wouldn't be profitable to tell them that. It's not my place to tell them that. 
That's one of the distinctions that I'm talking about here. Honesty may be the best policy, but honesty doesn't always mean full disclosure. In fact, there are times when it's not good to give full disclosure. You can tell the truth sometimes without revealing everything that you know or everything that you're thinking. And there are times when I can simply say, I can't give you that information. That's not for me to tell. Now, obviously, reciting information or saying things under the guise of honesty can actually be gossip and slander as well. And so we want to make sure that we avoid those things. The bottom line is this. It's always wrong to be untruthful, whether in the small things or the big things. There's no such thing as, as little white lies or, or big black lies. There's no categories to put lying in. That's something that we have done to soothe our conscience as a culture. Untruth is untruth. And we must avoid it at all costs. Motive has everything to do with lying, and therefore we should make sure that our motives are pure. But you know, we can all recognize the obvious. We can all understand what is wrong when, when we see somebody lying under oath, for instance. Many of us don't buy it when someone lies to cover up their wrong, and we know the wrong that they did. We can see when somebody is trying to skirt the issue and trying to, to disown what it is that they did wrong rather than owning it. We can see the blatantly obvious. We know sometimes when, as a parent, our child has done something wrong and, and we're trying to you know, get to the bottom of the truth, even though we know the truth, we just want them to admit it. And we can tell when they're lying and when they're not. You know, I can remember as... As a teenager, I was probably 13, 14 years old, I had I'd gone to the store and, and I had bought some tobacco, snuff. And I had taken it home and I I'd, I'd tried some of it and I stuck the rest of it in a wood pile by the house. We never used that wood pile. It's been sitting there five years. Come home one day from school and it's gone. We decided to haul all the wood off. And I walk in the kitchen and guess what's sitting on the counter? That can of snuff. And my mom goes... Whose is that? She knew, she knew whose it was. I said, I have no idea. Where'd you find that? <laughs> well, of all places, we found it in the wood pile. And I said, well, how did that get there? Of course, the punishment was even worse later because I didn't tell the truth. But we can recognize those things. I think we know the obvious. What's not so easy for us to come to grips with is when we're sitting at home and we're relaxing and we're enjoying the day and the phone rings and our daughter, our son, or our spouse picks it up, and we say, I'm not here. What's not always easy to come to grips with is the fact that we wake up one morning and we really don't want to go to work, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with us except we don't have any get up and go. And so we call in sick, and we tell them we don't feel well, that we have a fever, we have the flu, or whatever it is, when we don't really. How many of you have promised someone that you would be at a certain place at a certain time and you didn't show up. Other things got in the way and you give some flimsy excuse later when they ask you about it. How many of you have promised to do things for your wife or your husband or for your children and you never follow through on them? Those are the things we don't like to come to grips with, right? Those are the things that may be a little more subtle, but do they not fall into the category of being untruthful? Do they not fall into the category of deception for selfish gain? You see, we need to avoid all of those things at all costs. We need to make sure that we're not just focusing on the big things, but that we're focusing on the little things as well, because they're important. And they're not so little by God's standard. I believe untruth is untruth, and we need to avoid it at all costs. The fictional story is told of a man who died and went to heaven as most of these fictional stories go, he gets to the pearly gates and Peter is standing there and Peter said, I'm sorry, we can't let you in. And the man says, why? And he said, because you're a liar. And he said, Peter, come on, you were a fisherman, you know what it's like. You know, being a, being a fisherman myself, I can, I can understand how the truth gets stretched sometimes, which is another phrase that we use, right? We don't like to say lying, so we just say that we, we stretch the truth or, or maybe we gloss over it. Untruth is untruth. We need to be seeking to be people who have pure motives, who have a tongue that speaks truth, who seeks the truth and speaks the truth in all matters. 
so that we let our light shine, so that others may see our, our good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. Remember, we are set apart, we're consecrated, we're different from the world around us. Let's not make excuses. Let's stop treating it like it's a class C misdemeanor sin and justifying it, and let's get serious about avoiding it. And maybe you're sitting here tonight, and maybe you've been lying to yourself about your spiritual condition, and you realize that, that something's got to be done. Quit trying to gloss over the fact that you are a sinner in need of salvation and put on Christ tonight. Maybe you are a child of God and you need the prayers and support of this church family for whatever reason. We want to help you with that as well. Whatever your need is, come now as we stand and as we sing.